FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's Halloween. That means the last day of October. October is a scary month, not just from the standpoint of... uh, it concluding with Halloween and Mischief Night, but from the standpoint of history and financial turmoil, but it looks like we escaped October relatively unscathed. So that's always a good thing. Well, one thing we always talk about is entrepreneurism here, because entrepreneurism, the reason I like it, the reason I'm an entrepreneur is because it all boils down to self-empowerment. Oh, and before I forget, because you know I will forget, email us kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at kerrylutz. So getting back to the theme of entrepreneurism, throughout history, there have been entrepreneurs from the guy who is working in his workshop putting out swords during the Roman Empire, designer swords and designer armor, and people who made shoes and clothing. The Middle Ages, you come out of the Dark Ages and you see the the rise of the guilds. And guilds were just loose amalgams of people who created goods that were necessary to expand the economy, what it was then, and to uh, to expand man's limited horizons. And really, it's really a, a thing with a lot of tradition and a lot of, of history behind it. When you look at entrepreneurism, entrepreneurs, most of them who are successful, most of you entrepreneurs who are successful, you don't just go out haphazard, half-cocked and bet the ranch on your latest crazy idea of which entrepreneurs always have more than your share of. No, you are looking to manage risk, things like that. Well, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce you to our next guest, someone who I think you can learn quite a bit from. His name is David J. Feynman. And David, your company is ViralIdeaMarketing.com. Welcome to FSN. Thank you for having me, Kerry. I appreciate you having me on the show. Always a pleasure. So, David, uh, just going back to how you started out, your history is a little unusual. You don't come from a long line of entrepreneurs. Uh, Really, you're the first in your uh, family being an entrepreneur. How, How did this happen? So when I was younger, I was always a runner and really saw a need in the marketplace for creating, you know, races that you know, we're higher end and we're, you know, fun and entertaining, kind of like this podcast right now, for example. So people do different things to escape. And I saw that in the market and was able to create a race or two of them that were actually quite successful when I was, you know, before I was in college and actually while I was in college. Um, And, you know, it really just came out of a passion for doing things and kind of like you started out the show saying um, entrepreneurship is more about passion. It's more about doing something that you want to do versus, you know, perhaps working in a job where, you know, there might be some things that you want to do and there's some things that your boss wants you to do. So entrepreneurship is kind of a very self-empowering thing. And it's something that, you know, I, you know, through my, through my experience in it and creating viral ideas have been able to create a company that, you know, I've wanted to create and my business partners want to create. And that's an environment that, you know, our employees enjoy working in. So somehow you were pretty much competitive, but you sound like you were a nonconformist from a young age. This is very true. And I, I think a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs will say the same thing. And there's definitely stories throughout my life of non-conforming, right? Like I wasn't the best student and I didn't get the best grades, but I could definitely persuade the professors to give me better <laughs> grades when I was in college. So I definitely did things to not necessarily act out, but to do things in a different way. And I'm sure a lot of the entrepreneurs that are listening perhaps can relate to things like this and doing things that are a little bit of, you know, out of the box thinking and a little bit of things that are you know, maybe not on your straight and narrow, but kind of glide you off into a path that's a little bit different. And, you know, that still works and that still people are drawn to. Yeah. You know, I credit my brother with developing in college, the negotiated grade. He'd go in for the first month and he'd basically score a B on the exam. Then he'd approach the professor and say, look, you know, I'm not going to get an A in your class. I'm probably going to wind up with a high C or a B. How about if we just cut to the chase, just give me the C and I won't show up and I won't bother you. And you'd be amazed how many uh, professors in his 
school in uh, in Southwest Louisiana were were more than happy to to agree to that uh, that arrangement. <laughs> yeah, but I, my, my, my negotiations went something similar in college, where it was you know let's negotiate this grade and like let's kind of see you know what buttons I could press the right way to kind of maybe not do the work but do something that you know. Um, you know, allowed me to get a grade that I wanted to get. But it's it's interesting you said that because it actually ties into building business. And it's it's, it's a weird thing, right? You, th- you think, oh, it's like a little weird that he would negotiate his grades. However, you know, in business, you know, the game and the rules of business are quite different than the games and the rules of school. And when you're playing in the game of entrepreneurship, you're you're playing you're you're playing a different game with a different set of rules. So when you're negotiating your grades, it's kind of similar to negotiating a contract or when you're negotiating uh, for a sale, it's, you know, something similar to that. So that, that's, that's kind of the, the hard skills that I learned in school. Right. And, you know, it got translated into building viral ideas and I wasn't necessarily passionate about a lot of the topics that were taught in school. Right. You know, for me, you know, taking, <laughs> right. for, for me, taking art history was like, like, you know, going to the dentist and getting a teeth, yeah, teeth torture, without anesthesia, <laughs> um, you know, carry forward to today, you know, I'm, I pretty much spend, you know, I'm, not that old. I'm 25 years old. I spend every day doing exactly what I want to do. And it's such like an empowering feeling to wake up every day, roll out of bed and go to an office that I've built and spend time with people that I've hired and, you know, work with a business partner that you know, we have a great relationship and build a company that, you know, helps other companies discover their why through video. So. Hey, well, that's a good thing. You're doing what you want to do. That really, to me, of being an entrepreneur is the ultimate goal. Uh, obviously. You want financial success. Nobody would be an entrepreneur who didn't want financial success. I shouldn't say that. There are people who literally just want to create their own job uh, yeah. where you, you really hate working for someone else and you just want a job that will pay you a similar amount of money and benefits, et cetera. But it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of heartache just to aspire to a job replacement for sure. So, so we fast forward to viral idea ideas, I should say viral ideas, marketing.com. That's your site and viral ideas. That's the company. So obviously you saw something, you had an idea and you said, Hey, the market is not satisfying this, or there's a need there that just isn't being addressed properly by the market. So were you like, you had an inspiration at some point. What happened? So, so the the company the company actually didn't originally start out as a company. So, kind of for any anyone that's an entrepreneur out there, maybe maybe you're kind of an entrepreneur in hiding, right? You're working in, you know, you're working in a job. You're working in, you know, something where you want to go do something on your own, but maybe you have a family, maybe you have kids. And I'm lucky that I'm 25 and I like have no real life responsibilities other than my business. But for someone who maybe isn't, you know, it's it's kind of a matter of, you know, for me was, you know, creating, you know, a small stream of revenue to start. So it was actually, it was actually kind of, and we had talked about this a little bit before we hopped on, it was kind of actually a gig before it actually became a company. So I took on, you know, about three clients with Zach, my business partner, and we started working with them and they went incredibly, incredibly well. And we basically formed a company around those three projects. And those companies are still with us today at Viral Ideas. So originally it didn't actually start out as a company. It just started out as a way for us to make a little bit of money. And then it mm-hmm. became an actual company from, from that need. And we started to see, you know, these companies that were coming into us that had bad experiences with perhaps other companies, other vendors, and an immense need for companies to, you know, create content and produce video in a way that makes sense in a 2017 world and not kind of, you know, a lot of the production companies that are out there now are producing it as if, you know, they're producing it for a television commercial and not producing it for a YouTube or Facebook environment. So we saw that opportunity from an original two, three gigs that we did mm-hmm. and built that into, you know, the company that we are today. Uh-huh. So it started with a few gigs and then it became yes. a company. So as far as the uh, video production between like what you see on television, what you see in the movies or other outlets, as opposed to, I guess you would call it do-it-yourself video, you know, YouTube, etc. What is the main difference there? Because you're both dealing with images, right? Right. So, so really, it's it's about a connection, and it's a it's a certain subtlety that um, a lot of you know, if you're looking to create video, a lot of 
a lot of people don't understand. So when you're watching a video, you don't necessarily remember specific facts or specific, you know, specific instances within the video. You're going to remember how you felt after the video. And that leads to you remembering the facts in the video. That leads to you remembering certain things. So in at, at viral and kind of when you're thinking about creating video, even if it's a do-it-yourself from your phone, it's more about the content and the story you create within the two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds that you're creating a video versus, you know, cramming down as much as you possibly can in a, you know, in a 15 second bite-sized commercial, which is essentially what old school video does, right? They take a 15 second spot, 10 second spot, and they try to cram as much into it as possible. But with social video and YouTube, it's more about telling a story over the course of, you know, whatever length of time you're, you're doing it. Right. Right. So, so there's a story involved because a lot of times you see these commercials that are so called professionally done and they don't have a concept. You know, there's no concept involved. Whereas when you're doing a video or whatever, social media, there's always a concept. It starts with a concept first and then connection after. Exactly. So it, start, it starts with the story. You draw, you draw a powerful emotional connection and that leads to you being able to draw a connection with the audience and get, you know, tens of thousands of views on, on a given video. So it's, the, the emotion and the and the energy that that type of energy drives the you know drives the rest of of, right. of what of what is created. Hey, so what's the uh, what's the biggest viewed video you ever created? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would I would say I would say stuff for for Zombie Run. Um, but I, I used to own a company called Zombie Run, and we we would get you know on on Facebook we would get hundreds of thousands of views on video on on um on individual videos but we have we have a concept here it's called micro viral where um a, a company that's local or a company that you know maybe is smaller doesn't necessarily need 10 million views to you know have their company have a you know a tremendous increase in 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 revenue you know in order to go micro viral if you hit 10 to 20,000 of the right people within a given audience within a given section of a market you could potentially you know increase your business to 3x and we've seen that happen multiple times with with videos that we've created. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that is something that I kind of grapple with because, uh, you know, everything is local when you get down to it. But my show, I've got an international audience. Only two thirds is U.S. based. Oh, well. Wow. And then uh, 15% Canada, 3 4% each Australia, UK, Germany, Netherlands. It kind of goes on and on. So, so, you know, this thing of finding the local niche is, is really difficult with the internet because it's internet. And internet marketing is so vast and broad, it's hard to do those narrow things, which is why traditional media, I think, has still got a place at the table. Yeah, and it's it's. I was I was actually having a conversation yesterday with one of my friends, and he, he's he's a bit into entrenched in in the digital marketing world, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how you know very prominent tech companies started to put up billboards, and. You know, his comment was, you know, why would they do this? Is this the death of this company? Is this is this the end for them? Right? They're starting to put up billboards. They're spending money on traditional advertising. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy was, no, right? You know, there's still a subset of the population. You know, you know, sixty. You know, my 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 grandma, you know, doesn't have a Facebook. She she <laughs> she doesn't understand what a Google ad is versus a Google right. organic search. So you know, in 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 relation to what you know, in relation to what she, you know getting to her as a consumer, you have to put a newspaper ad in, or you have to put a television commercial on, um, or you have to put up a billboard in a place that she's driving. So if she wants, if they want to get to that specific audience and they want to drive, you know, an incremental increase in business, they're going to have to start using, you know, some of the tech companies you see putting up billboards or putting up bus stop ads. And it is because it works in, yeah. in a way for them. It might not be the cheapest or most, you know, yeah. val you know valuable Efficient. thing in the current moment, but you know, it's not, you know, it's a little different. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that because like direct mail for the millennials is dead. Like anybody who wants to reach you, David, uh, you know, is, is basically not going to send you junk mail. So, so actually you would actually be surprised. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's interesting is we actually at viral are doing a direct mail campaign. So, <laughs> We're doing it because no one's doing it right now. Right. I was going to say that because and that creates an opportunity because uh, it's fallen out of vogue, mainly for targeting 
older consumers uh, yeah. like myself, more mature consumers. And, you know, even myself, uh, you know, I just pull it out of the mailbox and it literally goes into the garbage can, but it still has a place, at least at this point. Yeah. And we, we actually, I have one of them right here. So we send, we send these in the mail, right? So this is a picture of you know, part of our team and just thank you up top. So basically when, when someone engages with us, we'll just send them this thank you note in the mail. Mm -hmm. And of course they're getting all the digital drip from us anyway, right? They're getting our videos, they're right. getting, you know, Facebook, but they're also going to get this in the mail and it's handwritten from us and it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction. And it kind of, you know, every time we send these out, you know, we, we send them out to genuinely thank clients, but it also results in business for us because, you know, it's, it's different. It's something that's unique. So I, I think when thinking about direct mail, you can't do, if you send the mass mailer, it goes right in the trash. But if you send something that's a little bit more unique, it, it, it might end up in the right hands. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So you're, if you're an entrepreneur starting out today, David, what advice would you give that person? I, I would say, I would say un, understand what you're passionate about and do what's right for you. So a lot of times, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I know and, um, work with the, they'll, they'll look towards an entrepreneur like Branson, an entrepreneur like, um, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, like, you know, yeah. huge guys and they'll look to them and, and they'll see what they've created and they'll be like, I want to create that too. And you, you are not those guys that are big. You're not Mark Cuban. You're not Barbara Corker from Shag Tank. So I think it's important to understand who you are and what value you bring to the table and understand what you can create around yourself. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have to do it day in, day out. And as you know, as an entrepreneur, it's a lot of work. So, you know, it's, it's a huge sacrifice from other areas of your life. So if you're doing something you're passionate about within a scope of what you can do, then you'll be in a much happier place. And that job that you quit to become an entrepreneur actually becomes valuable versus, you know, something that you would want to go back to because, you know, you're just in over your head. <laughs> so what about the concept of uh, capital when you start out? How much uh, funding did you have? So we actually started in a, in a different way. So we started with, um, I believe it was $250 and yeah. we went to oh, our you first were, You were overcapitalized. We were <laughs> horribly overcapitalized, you know? <laughs> No, no, no. So, so we, so, and then we went to one of our clients and we said, Hey, we're you know, one of the three original gigs we had. And we said, Hey, we're, we're starting this now. Like, would you like to support us in this? You know, you're going to stick like, I hope, you know, you like the work. So you're going to stick with us for a bit. Would you mind giving us three months of, of work up front? And he mm -hmm. said, yes. So he gave us a check and we just started with, you know, I, I think it was something around in the neighborhood of like $10,000 in the bank. And, you know, with 10,000 plus the 250 that we started with that we graciously gave and that was it. So you know, that's all we started with. That's, it's so funny, David, because so many people think, oh, if I can only hook up with a shark, if I could only find this billionaire to write me a check, life would be perfect and wholly unnecessary, isn't it? I mean, at least in my opinion, for my type of business, it is right. Like I, I all I needed was customers and, and cash flow and a little bit up front. And I was in business and we've been able to acquire equipment over time. And, you know, we've we've been able to hire people and we've been able to give you know other people jobs. So it hasn't been for us. You know, we haven't had someone write us a check for $100,000 or $200,000 like you see on Shark Tank, because that just means that for us, we're going to have to give up a percentage of the company. And also we're, we understand that, you know, we hope to be in business for 10, 15 years, right? We don't need to, you know, dump 200,000 of someone's money into marketing today to hopefully pay off. You know, we can grow so and slutty over a period of time and be in business. Yeah. You know, yeah. Definitely. Well, so you used creative startup financing. I'll just share personal experiences of my own with the exception of my last company, which I don't want to get into. It's the, was hugely successful, but it wasn't a real happy experience uh, for some of it, but a lot of it was. Uh, but I found that the businesses that did best that I started were the businesses that had the least startup <laughs> capital, all right, that I started on a shoestring and it just kind of grew from there and always been that way because the, um, I think it was, uh, What's his name? Uh, Damon John wrote a book called The Art of uh, or The Power, Power of Broke. Broke, right? So it's a little absurd, but most of the people I know who really have uh, have hit it out of the park, who've really built something, generally, uh, you know, they were like Steve Jobs, like in the garage, you know, nothing. And as they grew and as you grow, the capital finds you if if you're really doing something that warrants it. 
And, you know, that's what I found. So you're much better off starting with no money than starting with too much money. Because when you have no money and the idea is bad, then you haven't lost much. You have a lot of money and the thing doesn't work, which let's face it, most of them are not going to work. It's just a fact of life or they won't work in the form that you're trying to make them work. More importantly, then it fails and, you know, you've got to loans, you got to friends that are hate your guts because you lost their life savings. You got all of these people who feel that you've done them wrong and you feel like a failure. Whereas, hey, you lose, if you'd lost 250 bucks, if the thing didn't work, David, how would you have felt? You know, I, I, I probably wouldn't have sneezed much about it. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> all right, next, right? Yeah. So, so that's why it's so important. And, and uh, you know, you're so much more sharp. You're so much more on the ball and you're so more, it's you than when you have the money and you say, oh, let's just hire somebody to do that banner. All right. Well, it's only $500. Just hire them. Whereas say, well, that's 500 bucks. I'm going to have to put on my credit card and pay. You know what? Let's figure out a better way to do it. You're smarter because the money means more because you don't have it. The people paying you, like your clients also mean a lot more. So I, I think one of the reasons we've grown so quickly um, in the past two and a half years of business is because we're fanatical about, you know, making sure our clients' needs are met. So I think if you have a lot of money in the bank, you, know, you lose one client, not a big deal, yeah. but we make sure we keep every single client happy that we ever have. And they become, you know, we just recently started marketing or up till now, pretty much, you know, a couple of months ago, we pretty much just grown all, all organically. And now we're just starting to go out there and acquire more clients and bring them in, you know, through traditional advertising methods. But our, our customers are our salespeople and, you know, it helps build our, our business from there. Well, that's, that's really powerful, Dave. I mean, the fact is, yeah, every client counts when you're in that startup phase and you can't afford to lose any of them and you do everything you can to make them happy. Whereas you're overcapitalized, eh, customers, we've got <laughs> we lost a few. Yeah, so big deal. We'll get more. Hey, well, it's been real interesting speaking with you. Your site, viralideasmarketing.com. And the name of the company is Viral Ideas. Thank you very much. I appreciate hey. you having me. All right. Hey, and any questions for David or myself, just email me, kl at kerrylutz.com. Again, the Twitter feed is at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. David, we wish you the best of luck and uh, you're an inspiration. Thank you. I appreciate it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.